Science is meant to bother people because it means we're not thinking about things correct. If it bothers you, then do something about it. In the Sydney dialogue, and then again in the Melbourne dialogue, Dr. Krauss put up a PowerPoint slide of a private email message that he had received from Alexander Vilenkin, whose theorem I quoted in support of the beginning of the universe, uh, ostensibly claiming to undercut the evidence for the beginning of the universe. For Dr. Craig, the beginning of the universe is very important. Because if it had a beginning, he believes it must have come from God. And he quotes a theorem due to, due to a, a few friends of mine uh, that basically says the universe, if it's expanding now and, a, as we measure it, had to have a beginning. And he argues that that's, that's irreconcilable to, with anything else. And I, as we argued in, in Brisbane, I said that's not true. And he said, no, Alex Vilenkin, one of the authors, has recently shown it's true. So I wrote Alex, who's a good friend of mine, and he just emailed me. And he said, only theorem is only as good as its assumption. There's a loophole for contraction, private expansion, and there's no such thing as absolute certainty in science. Note, for example, the BGV theorem uses the classical picture of space-time. In the case of quantum mechanics, it's out the window. And at the beginning of the universe, that's when quantum mechanics matters. And of course, since this is a private, unpublished letter, there's no way to check its accuracy. Um, and therefore, it, it, it makes it difficult to respond to such a thing. Now, someone took a cell phone photo of the PowerPoint in the Sydney Dialogue, and I had a chance then to look at it and analyze it before the Melbourne Dialogue. And what I noticed were some very suspicious and interesting features of this. In the opening paragraph of this letter from Vilenkin, he says that, they, that a possible loophole around the board guth vilenkin theorem is that there might be an epoch of contraction prior to the expansion. And in this way, the universe would not have been in a state of cosmic expansion on average throughout its history if you had this contracting phase prior to the expanding phase. And the email message says, such models have been discussed by Aguirre and Grattan and by Carol and Chen. Well, immediately my antenna went up because I thought, these are the very models that Vilenkin discusses in the paper that I quoted from, that he presented last year at Cambridge University, in which he says none of these scenarios can actually be past eternal. And he shows specifically by name why the Aguirre-Grattan model and the Carol Chen model do not succeed in restoring an eternal past. So as I looked at this, I thought, when he says a possible loophole, what he must mean is that here's a possible way you might try to get around the theorem, but in fact, this won't work. He closes the loophole. That's what he does in the paper. Well, I'd like to see this again, this private email put up on the screen you... uh, to see who has misquoted Vilenkin. Well, I, I put it up there so he would quote himself. That's better than actually quoting him, I generally find. Okay, that's it, isn't it? Okay, All is right. it up here? Yeah. Okay, now notice it says, a theorem is only as good as its assumptions. The BGV theorem says that if the universe is on average expanding along a given world line, this world line cannot be extended uh, or cannot be infinite to the past. A possible loophole is that there might be an epoch of contraction prior to the expansion. Models of this sort have been discussed by Aguirre and Grattan and by Carroll and Chen. Now the thing is, Lawrence, that in the very paper that I quoted from Alex Vilenkin last April, he shows specifically by name that the Aguirre and Grattan model and the Carroll and Chen model don't work. That no, no, he said you have to make an assumption about entropy. You yes. have to make an assumption about the evolution of entropy at the point of minimum size. Those well, that's, so you have to make an assumption, which he would argue that they don't have any rationale for. 
That's not the same as saying that they're wrong. Well, yes it is. I, he, he argues that the, all of the evidence shows that the universe had a beginning. And I had seen a similar letter like this that Vilenkin wrote to Victor Stinger that is out there on the, the web in which he says very much the same thing. He says you could have a contraction prior to the expansion. But then the letter to Stinger goes on to say, this might make it sound like there's nothing the matter with having a contraction, but in fact, such a model would involve all kinds of messy singularities so that it would never get to the expanding phase. In other words, these models don't work. They don't succeed in restoring an eternal past. And I thought, that's what he meant when he said a possible loophole. Could it have been something like this? You can evade the theorem by postulating that the universe was contracting prior to some time. This sounds as if there's nothing wrong with having a contraction prior to expansion. But the problem is that a contracting universe is highly unstable. Small perturbations would cause it to develop all sorts of messy singularities so that it would never make it to the expanding phase. That, there's, there's, that's there, the there's a growth, there's a... It, it. And that's then, Kevin, when I noticed the ellipsis points in the email message dot, that Krauss reproduced. Yes, dot, 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 indicating material had been deleted from this email. I couldn't help notice, although it's down from the screen now, that there was a series of ellipsis points following the paragraph. Yeah, because it was technical, and I thought well, it was, you know. I wonder what you've deleted from the original letter. <laughs> I, I just, I just, I just, no way. I, just, I thought Krauss has omitted some of this letter. What did he leave out? Could it have been a qualifying phrase similar to what he offered to Stenger? Well, I had no way at that time of knowing because I didn't have the original letter. But in the Melbourne Dialogue, I confronted Krauss on this, and I said, in the paper at Cambridge, these very models are mentioned by name as not restoring a past eternal universe, and I wonder what you've omitted from this letter by Vilenkin. And Krauss's response was, technical material. And he said this more, one. I told you, technical material. Well, in fact, Kevin, it wasn't technical material. I have now obtained a copy of the original letter. Alex Vilenkin has sent it to me. And can I read you the two sentences that are deleted from the letter? Please. Okay. He says, models of this sort have been discussed by Aguirre at Grattan and by Carol and Chen. And then here's the deleted sentences. They had to assume, though, that the minimum of entropy was reached at the bounce and offered no mechanism to enforce this condition. It seems to me that it is essentially equivalent to a beginning. Uh-oh. Yeah. That second sentence would have been devastating for Krauss to quote in the dialogue. Vilenkin's whole point is that these models are equivalent to a universe with a beginning in that they have a universe in which you have a minimal entropy state from which two arrows of time go out. You have, in a sense, a, a, a twin universe two arrows of time that both emerge from a common origin point, a common beginning. It is not a past eternal universe, and that's why he rejects them in the Cambridge paper as restoring a past eternal universe. So this quotation was deliberately doctored by Dr. Krauss to give a contrary impression. And I find this so ironic, Kevin, in light of 
Krauss's opening remarks in Brisbane about the need in science for honesty, transparency, and full disclosure, which he then, in the severest terms, criticized me for violating, when in fact, it, it turns out that it was Krauss himself who was um, doing this. Oh, yeah. I mean, and that would scare you, me to death. It would scare me to death if I'm on stage like you were, and I present Vilenkin's material, and then my opponent stands up and says, well, here is my personal email from Vilenkin. You're thinking, uh-oh, you know. But it turns out <laughs> that there's so much verification uh, because you're uh, uh, of, of this and uh, what vilenkin has been saying. Yeah. Uh, and it, the, mean, one of the positive things to come out of this unhappy episode is that it has put me in touch with Alex Vilenkin so that we've been able to correspond now on this issue. And I wrote to Vilenkin the following. I want to quote from my letter to Vilenkin. I said, you should be aware that your work has entered into popular culture where it has become the subject of heated debate. Certain staunchly secular thinkers want to avoid the beginning of the universe because to them it smacks of theism, and so they are bent on reconstruing the significance of your work. That is why you are receiving letters from people like Stenger, Krauss, et al., I hope to have understood and represented you accurately. If not, I want to be corrected. That's very generous of you, Bill. I mean, well, it really no, is. I do. I do. <laughs> if I'm misunderstanding him, I want to know. And and here's what Vilenkin, uh, in part, wrote back to me, Kevin. He says, I think you represented what I wrote about the BGB theorem in my papers and to you personally very accurately. He then goes on to say, this is not to say that you represented my views as to what this implies regarding the existence of God. Falenkin, as we know, is an agnostic. Uh, he says, which is okay, since I have no special expertise to issue such judgments. And he goes on to say that he thinks that the uh, board guth falenkin theorem is neutral on the existence of God. And he thinks that you could explain the beginning of the universe uh, naturalistically as a quantum event. And I've responded to uh, Vilenkin's theory both in Reasonable Faith and in the uh, Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology. But the thing that was so gratifying to me, Kevin, was that in the face of these statements by Dr. Krauss that you don't understand Vilenkin's paper, you don't understand this theorem, Vilenkin himself says that you have represented what I've written about the theorem uh, very accurately. And that was really gratifying to hear. You and Dr. Vilenkin were on a panel together at Berkeley. Yes, that's so. right. Several years ago, there was a Templeton-sponsored conference on science and theology. Again, part of this flourishing dialogue between science and theology that I talked about in my Brisbane opening statement. And that was the first chance I had to, to meet him and, and get to know him. And I don't know if he remembered me from that uh, little roundtable conference, but it was fascinating to hear his story coming from Russia. He is an agnostic, and I find it actually very helpful, Kevin, that he is an agnostic because no one can accuse Vilenkin of having a theological axe to grind in his very unflappable defense of the beginning of the universe and of the Bordguth Vilenkin theorem. I do want to say one other thing with respect to what Krauss had to say, because he not only presented that opening paragraph, but he also appealed to a statement of Vilenkin's later in the email message where Vilenkin says that if there is a quantum theory of gravity, then we may not even know the right questions to ask. And Krauss interpreted this to mean that we're just utterly uncertain about whether or not the universe began to exist. What Vilenkin's email back to me, however, shows is he said that Krauss had asked him to respond to the claim that the board guth vilenkin theorem definitively rules out a beginningless universe. And Vilenkin properly responded, in science, we don't deal with definitive sorts of arguments. What Vilenkin thinks is that it's more plausible than not 
that the universe began to exist in light of the evidence. And that's exactly the position that I take. And as for the influence of quantum gravity upon this conclusion, what Vilenkin uh, goes on to explain is that it is not quantum gravity as such which would invalidate the board guth vilenkin theorem. That theorem has only one condition, Kevin, and that is that the universe is, on average, in a state of cosmic expansion over its history. It doesn't presuppose the gravitational equations of Einstein's general theory of relativity. So Vilenkin is clear that even if that needs to be modified, the theorem will still hold so long as you have a universe which is expanding over time on average uh, throughout its history. Are However, you saying that even, even if a newer theory and some more uh, uh, the thorough theories of gravity come about, that that still is not going to affect? Exactly. It won't uh, invalidate the theory. What okay. would invalidate the theory would be if you were to utterly dissolve time so that time no longer exists, because then you couldn't say that the universe is expanding on average yeah. throughout its history because there wouldn't be any time, there wouldn't be any before and after. But that isn't based upon quantum gravity. You can have quantum gravity theories in which you do have a, a, a time parameter and the theorem will still apply. In fact, in Mladenov and Hawking's most recent book, The Grand Design, in that book, they interpret the quantum gravity regime to be temporally ordered. And so the what they call the lines of latitude as, as the universe shrinks down and goes back to the South Pole, they say that that represents the beginning of time and of the universe at the South Pole. They think of it as temporally ordered, even though it's a quantum gravity theory. So in fact, Dr. Krauss has just seriously misrepresented Vilenkin's views on this subject. And for those listeners who are interested in this, I'm putting these email communications on our website in their entirety, unabridged, in question 336, question of the week, 336, where they can read this correspondence.